Welcome to Beyond Disruption, where you'll learn how emerging tech is changing the world of accounting, business, and finance. Our guest experts break down the latest news in everything from blockchain to robotics, artificial intelligence to human intelligence. Tune in to find out how you can stay ahead of the curve. Hello, thanks for listening to this episode of the Go Beyond Disruption podcast, where we share insights on emerging technology, human intelligence, and digital transformation. Every week, we bring you expert perspectives from inside the accounting and finance profession that help you stay ahead of the curve. From Bristol, UK, I'm Kyle Hannan. In this episode, we'll be talking about how to ride the innovation curve and basing our discussion on revealing insights from new research on the past century's worth of management accounting. And we'll be doing that with my expert guest, Dr. Martin Farrar. He is Associate Technical Director for Management Accounting here at the AICPA, which, just in case you may have wondered, is the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. We'll answer questions like, why is history important in today's accounting and finance context? What is the importance of the S-curve when most people are thinking about the hockey stick curve? And, with apologies to Game of Thrones, why the phrase winter is coming may actually not be such a bad thing after all. If you want more information, you can find links and more resources in our show notes, which you can view inside your podcast app or by going to gobeyonddisruption.com. Let's get started with this week's conversation with Dr. Farrar. Hello, Martin. Where are you speaking from today? Hi, I'm I'm in the uh, um, headquarters in London at the Helicon, so City of London. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your insights with our listeners in more than 145 countries around the world. You are a researcher. You specialize in the future of finance. You look at sustainability, strategy and the history of management accounting. And before you joined the association's research and development team, you worked closely with the Chartered Institute of Management Accounting, uh, SEMA's senior management team and their council as a strategic planner to define, to implement and to report on corporate strategies and to build future capability. Your research has been published in several white papers and you've contributed to the ongoing developments of the SEMA professional qualification syllabus. Now, let's talk about you, the researcher, because you hold a PhD from King's College London. You uh, did yours at the War Studies Department and your ongoing research into the First World War led to a publication of your recent book on the uh, reporting of war. So with all of that, what have I left out? What else are you working on and how does it connect with our topic today? OK, well, in January this year, I worked on a white paper, Reinventing Finance for Digital World. And that was the story behind the research for the updated syllabus that's been launched in January 2019 for the SEMA professional qualification. Um, our research over the last two years focused on the challenges that organisations are facing. It then looked at the performance required by fun finance functions to meet those challenges and then the types of skills and competencies and mindsets that finance professionals need to acquire to work in a digital world. So at the moment, I'm now taking that research to a deeper level and looking specifically at how strategy is changing in a digital world. And that work is due to come out in the autumn. Now, I have to ask the question, how did you become a researcher of the finance profession? Were you an accountant first or did you start off as a historian? Um. The simple answer to that question is by accident. Um, after leaving university, I turned my history degree into a book, the dissertation. I upscaled it and turned it into a book. But with minimal royalty advances, I needed a job. And my second job out of university brought me to the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants. And here I am 22 years later. So I've been working around SEMA. I've worked in the uh, member services. I've worked in the education department, secretariat, project management and strategy development. And then most recently, um, research. And during those 22 years, I completed my um, MA in history and a part time PhD. Um, the part time PhD, PhD was a labour of love and that took 10 years to complete. So first, I'm a military historian with 22 years experience of the management accounting profession. 
Um, what I find interesting is the crossover. Um, I read a lot about military theories and strategies and how they incubate. And later on, they then cross over into, into the business space and are used by businesses to move forward. So it's a historian with with an experience of working in the accounting world. That is fascinating. So 22 years and all sorts of, of, of different uh, smaller journeys in internally as well. But uh, nothing compares to the journey that management accounting has taken over the last 100 years. And that's the bit that you've been talking about your research into. SEMA, uh, which is the Chartered Institute of Management Accounting, is celebrating its centenary year this year. We're recording this in mid-2019. So you did mention that you've been hard at work on something quite remarkable, which looks into that history, which was recently published. Give us, give us more information about that. Yeah, so over the last year, I've spent my time reading Institute papers, meeting minutes, and also the Institute journal to give me a feel of what cost and management accountants have achieved over the last 100 years. So all that information has culminated in the publication of a book called Leading the Transformation, a journey through 100 years of the Institute. And it's been quite a journey. Um, it started, well, it kind of started in the First World War because the, the First World War bonded isolated individuals who were doing cost accounting into a community and this led to the formation of the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants in 1919. Then through the 1920s and 30s, uh, the Institute developed costing as a science. So it was a period when costing standards and repeatable costing scientific methods were written down and collected into a body of knowledge and then promoted to a wider community. So that's that's kind of how it all started. Then the Second World War interrupts the progress of the Institute because it, it has to have a war focus. And then from the 1950s to the mid-1970s, there's a shift from being focused on costing to management accounting. Um, then from 1976 to the present, the Institute and and the accountants moves from management accounting to value. And we can see we can see this move today as management accountants move out of the back office and into the centre of business. They're no longer internally focused producing reports, but are now communicating with the whole of the business and with external stakeholders to influence decision making. So it's been it's been quite a fascinating change over the last hundred years of how um, accountants have adapted and changed to meet the uh, the environment and where the world's going. We know that accountants are great with numbers. They're great with uh, profit and loss statements and, and putting out reams of, of figures. But where do you get the information about the profession that doesn't relate to that type of data? Where does this kind of research actually need to start? Where do you get all of this information from? Um, well, the... The Institute Journal is a really good place to start because it documents it documents like meetings of branch meetings and what they were discussing. And they're in these branch meetings, they're not discussing numbers. They're discussing what's happening, theories, their own experiences. So they they rise above the numbers when they're talking to each other. It's it's looking at problems and solutions, not not just just not just the number crunching. So that that's there's so many fascinating articles about what 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 was the focus in the 1920s, 30s, 50s, and what management accountants were doing. And this means going to places, uh, perhaps archives, uh, libraries, where these physical journals are in storage, and then having to go to the actual printed journal somewhere on a shelf, opening it, and going through page by page, the physical printed records that you then have to turn into something that will now be available, I would imagine, as a digital ebook. Uh, things have changed, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, it certainly have. But yeah, that, that's the process because at the moment, none of our archives have been, are, have been digitally scanned. So they're, they're all in boxes in a warehouse. So essentially, this type of research is information that will be available to most people digitally now for the first time based on the work yes. that you've done. So let's talk 
bit about that research. Uh, you've looked at the past 100 years of the profession. How has that informed or changed the way you think about it? Um, I think my main learning point is kind of hindsight bias. When people now talk to me that we're in a VUCA world and, you know, change, disruption, it's it's never been like this before. I kind of now roll my eyes because um, the accountant in 1919, it was just as unstable then as it is today. I don't I don't I don't see I don't see a difference. And kind of hindsight bias is saying that somehow the past was more stable and predictable than it is today. So. If you think you're having it tough, just just read some history. I mean, it's always been like that. So um, that's kind of my number one learning is that I've been reading articles that like 1928 talk about mechanization and how is the management accountant going to cope? How are they going to change their skills? And 90 years later, I'm, I'm writing the same sort of thing in in the reinventing finance for a digital age. I think the other thing that's been amazing is how cost accountants and management accountants are, are, are so adaptable. I mean, the tool of choice in 1926 was a slide rule. So how how we've come on and used technology to, to really up our skills and make a difference to business, it's truly fascinating. I have to throw some more data into the mix. We've recently discovered that our audience, more than half of our audience for this podcast, is in the age range between about 19 and 45. Um, very few of them will have heard of something called a slide rule, much less used one. So can you explain what this essential accounting tool of the 1920s was? What is a slide rule? <laughs> That's a good question. Um I mean, I've seen them. My, my dad had one and I've been to Bletchley Park. There's a National Computing Museum and there's a whole display case full of slide rules. Supposedly, it was like a, a calculator of the day that you could calculate logarithms and uh, convert lengths and uh, decimal points. Those people who have never actually used a slide rule or know what they are will put a link to a video in our show notes, which explains just what the essential tool for a management accounting in the 1920s was. It's amazing. That was a uh, um, editorial in a 1926 management accounting journal, which said that the slide rule was the tool of choice. And it's just amazing to read this kind of stuff. Well, that's exactly why we're speaking to you, Dr. Farrar, about this kind of research. It's only by looking back that we understand what lies ahead. And I think what you've explained now is, is something that for many people will be a complete surprise, that the First World War essentially was the spark for the creation of this, this new category of finance professional, the management accountant, and that disruption and mechanization and, and, and transformation because of technology was, was happening even then. So we know that disruption never stops. So what else did your research on the profession's first 100 years reveal about innovation and, and change? I think it has to be with people. Without good people, you don't get innovation and you don't get change. So it's about investing in people, not just about investing in technology. If you just invest in technology, the technology will not make a difference. It just sits there. Without the people to be able to use it to its infinite possibilities, that's, that's where you make a difference. It's interesting that modern war warfare has become blurred and military are, are investing in kind of like aircraft carriers when when naturally war today is no longer about two forces lined up against one another and an aircraft carrier in a situation where you don't understand your enemy is no help so it isn't just building technology and hoping that's going to help you it's about the people that use the technology to its its best ability and the, the scary thing is for business is that business is now becoming the front line in this blurred warfare. So we, businesses need to be more adapt that, that they're liable for a cyber attack or fake news information about them. So you really need to think differently. And I think you mentioned even back in the, the 20s going through these um, professional journals that a professional membership organization is also very important because you you talk about the businesses you talk about warfare which is normally between state entities um, but 
today is much more about the individual and as a membership organization, for example, like the Chartered Institute of Management Accounting or the ARCPA as well, um, professional community is very important. So tell us a little bit about the role of the individual. How do individuals and these professional communities we've been talking about combine in a way to affect innovation? What what roles do they play when things are changing and areas of disruption? Well, most of us probably think that real innovate real innovation is kind of like a, a eureka moment in a bathtub. It's individuals like uh, Charles Darwin and the uh, origins of the species. He, it, it's a single person do, who who creates something. Well, actually, it's more likely to be through collaboration and networks that you get innovation. And that's where um, the Chartered, Chartered Institute of Management Accountants helps because it provides a safe space to test and refine thinking theories and bring different networks together. I mean... The birth of the Institute in 1919 was a drive between um, cost accountants and actually engineers. Engineers were um, of the seven individuals that came together to form the association. Four of them were engineers. So it was engineering crossing with with cost accounting that, that brought together this science and brought together this community. And then if you look to what the Institute was doing in the 1920s and 30s. Branch events were really important. Bran branch events would, could consist of going to tour factories and industries. So um, there was a trip to the uh, Ford motor car plant at Romford in, in the late 1920s where anybody in that area could go and learn about new technology that was happening there and then apply it to their own their own industry. And I think... Management accountants as business partners are also perfectly placed to facilitate innovation across an organisation. They're able to bring collaboration from siloed parts of the business, get them talking to each other and move innovation forward. And they're really important in what what is currently seems to be a increasingly polarised world that we live in, that they can bring that collaboration and also that we, we need to compromise and to move innovation forward. So your research has actually showed that very much in contrast to what you said is a much more siloed approach today where uh, people are trying to keep as much as they can confidential. 100 years ago, transparency was very much the name of the game. So history obviously helps us understand origins, but why else is history important in today's accounting and finance context? I think it's important because history can help you make sense of your present situation. I think it can remind you that there were other situations like what you're experiencing in the past. And then it, it kind of changes your curiosity and the kind of questions you're going to answer. And we have to try and make sense of the world in a non-linear world. It's what the uh, author Hans Rowlands in his book, Factfulness calls the straight line in instinct that when we look at when we look at growth or 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 things like that, we're always looking for a straight line, and actually, it's it's unlikely to be a straight line. And I think that leads us very nicely into the discussion that we'll be having in a minute or two about um, other types of lines, the the S curve, which is so important in your research. Um, We'll continue that conversation shortly as we find out more about your fascinating research. We'll be looking at the insights that may be buried in those S-curves. We'll be discussing where all of this takes us next as the profession transforms yet again. That's all coming up. I'm Kyle Hannan. You are listening to the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. It's brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. You can find out more about this podcast and about the rest of our wider project at gobeyonddisruption.com. I'd like to welcome new listeners who may be discovering the podcast for the first time. You can find out more about us at uh, gobeyonddisruption.com. Just scroll down the page, click on the subscribe button to get these podcasts automatically and totally free as often as they come out. And if you're already a subscriber, thanks very much for listening. 
Uh, why not share the show with your colleagues or your wider network? Do it on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, use the hashtag Go Beyond Disruption. You'll also find uh, easy share links in our show notes because it's always nice for uh, our conversations to reach new people. Speaking of which, uh, we're talking to Dr. Martin Farrar about how to ride the innovation curve. And we're basing that conversation on his insights from his recently published research covering 100 years of management accounting. Marta, there's so much focus on the hockey stick curve, which plots the explosive growth of a service or a business. Uh, we know the hockey stick curve. Um, it's fairly flat. And then there's a sudden, like a like the end of a hockey stick, a sudden leap. But your research shows us that there's much more important stuff to learn from another type of curve, the S-curve. Your research has plotted, uh, I think at last count, six of them. And they tell us much more about things more than just the upturns that most businesses seem to like to focus on. So tell us what's so important about the way the, the S-curve plots the, the downturns as well. Okay, well, it wasn't something, when I started out doing this research, it wasn't something I was looking for. It just kind of, it was a pattern that developed out of the 100 milestones that where innovation and technology was taking place. It seemed to go up and then go then go down. And so... What a what an S curve can tell us is if it can, you kind of start with a birth at the the bottom of the S and at the once you once you see this innovation starting in its infancy you should start to develop new skills about that innovation and then 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 it will start moving up the S and that's growth and at that point you need to then accelerate your learning and and that's quite quite fast and then as you move over to the top of the s curve you're in maturity so that's where you're getting most of your your innovation your business from and then the s curve will start to to move downwards and that's where you should start it's kind of retirement and you should think about unlearning the skills that you've learned at birth at the birth of this curve think about new skills and then you've got to think about leaping to something new the new innovation that's a new S curve that's going to take you further on and grow. So from 1919, you have an S curve that, that after the First World War, production goes down, there's a bit of a dip, and then mechanization happens in about 1928 to 1933. And so accountants at that time, uh, the articles are all about we need to change our skills. Our uh, punch card machines are going to, are, are going to wipe out cost clerks so in the 1928 to 1933 era accountants were changing what they were doing and and honing their skills then you had the second world war so there was there was a dip again and then after the second world war we have the 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 challenge of electronics to the accountant and that was from about 1957 to 66 so big computers the mainframes that the were the size of rooms or even buildings are putting to into offices and they changed the nature of how accountants dealt with uh, data and changed the way the tasks of a management accountant in the 1960s and then from about 66 maybe to about 1980 we have kind of the over promise of the digital age and it turns into what uh, commentators have called uh, the first ai winter so the hype disappears and people just carry on. Then another S curve happens from about 1980 to 1987, and that's when the microcomputer comes into into the office uh, spreadsheets, and it and it moves the accountant from purely tactical tasks to actually strategic accounting. Then from about 1988 to 1993, there's a second AI winter where maybe innovation dips a bit or the microcomputer doesn't develop as fast as people thought. And then from 1994 to possibly the current day, we have the new golden age where we have um, the World Wide Web, email, and then we have um, artificial intelligence and algorithms driving a lot of what, what management accountants do. 
you see these these waves of innovation going up and down and it's important for management accountants to understand where they think they are on the S curve that they're riding to work out whether they need to develop new skills, accelerate new the, the skills they've already got or dump skills and move on to something new. So it's it's really fascinating stuff. I know this may sound a little like Game of Thrones, that tagline that you see everywhere, you know, winter is coming. But you've talked about that phenomenon, uh, which which references winter. So instead of dragons, uh, we have downturns. Expand a little more on that for us. Tell us about that first. Did you call it an AI winter? Yeah, the artificial intelligence winter of um, it was the late 60s to uh, the early 80s. It was a period of where there was reduced funding and interest in artificial intelligence, and the term was coined as an analogy to the idea of a nuclear winter. It's because the the field experienced kind of like hype cycles. So you get all this hype about a technology, and you're all like, "Oh yeah, we must be, we must be looking at uh, digital processing in 1957," and then it follows that the hype doesn't quite match match what people are expecting and that that is followed by disappointment criticism and then funding there's funding cuts and and people move on and then then a few years later there's renewed interest so yeah we've talked about two artificial winters mid 1960s to the mid 80s and the second ai winter of 88 to 93 and the second AI winter, the I think the dot com bubble burst in around nineteen ninety two, ninety three. So that could be a reason for it. And a downturn always followed by an upturn. So an AI winter isn't necessarily something uh, to fear. That's good. So let's keep technology in the spotlight and go back to your research. What does it tell you about technology hypes? Uh, du jour. What do you think is is the big technology hype at the moment? Um, that's a very good question, and I I don't really know. But if we look at blockchain technology, I think blockchain technology has been around since two thousand and nine. And at the end of twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen, if you Google it, the media is running stories that talk about a blockchain winter and crypto winter. So, you know, you've got that, that hype of blockchain there, oh, it's coming, it's coming. And then at the beginning end, beginning of this year, the media is talking about maybe, maybe we were in a, in a blockchain winter. But then, so I'm thinking about that. And then just last week, Facebook announces Libra, the, the new global currency for the internet, you know, paying for things or transferring money across borders that will be as simple and as cheap as sending a text message. So here we are again, the hype's building. Facebook as a major player is about to use blockchain to to change the way it it does business. And blockchains are all about kind of trust between parties. And I mean, with the recent publicity that Facebook's had, are they the people to, to build trust? It's a really interesting time. So blockchain is where we are thinking about whether it's, is it at the peak of an S curve? or it's going into uh, um, decline. I don't know, but it's one to look for. Well, time will tell. And it's interesting that the uh, the mention of Facebook's Libra currency followed fairly hot on the heels of announcement a couple of weeks before that, that Apple is launching its own uh, credit card, I believe, uh, a payment service in that, in that, uh, that way. So um, certainly things are changing. So perhaps it's a good opportunity to look at the next disruption because you've talked about the S-curves you've got in your research. We know there are six of them there at the moment. And I think we've all heard people talk about the phenomenon of the the seventh wave, how uh, every seventh wave is always the biggest one. Perhaps that's just the old surfer in me. But I I think it applies to the management accounting profession and and to your research too, doesn't it? I mean, what what is that next S-curve going to be showing us? Will the, the seventh one be the biggest one yet? Well, this is where I'm I'm kind of conflicted here. There's the six S-curves that I've looked at so far have all been about technology. And I wonder whether the seventh one is going to be different. Um, if you look at the World Economic 
risk report for 2019. It's dominated by environmental related risks for the third year in a row, and they account for three of the top five risks by likelihood and by impact. By likelihood, we're looking at extreme weather events, failure of climate change mitigation and adaption, and natural major natural disasters. And by impact, it's failure of climate change mitigation and adoption, extreme weather events, water crises, and major natural disasters. So actually, I think the the next S-curve is likely to be impacted or is likely to be um, the effects of possible climate change. So whether you believe in climate change or not, I think it's important that you think about, well, what are the risks and scenario planning of like whether sea level temp- sea level goes up or temperature rises by 1.5 degrees would be a good way of understanding how your business is, is impact on such a high risk. So that's where I'm seeing businesses need to be uh, alert and thinking about how this is going to impact on my business. Certainly a deep dive into what your research has shown. There's so much we could be talking about, but I think we, we need to, to wrap up because we only have so much time. And I think it's perfect uh, a perfect opportunity to do some signposting for, for anyone who'd like to find out more about this, uh, these topics, uh, perhaps in general about your work in particular. Uh, what are some resources you'd recommend? Where would you suggest people go online to find out more about um, the things we've been talking about today? Um, I'd check out the Management Accounting Research and Thought Leadership on cgma.org. One of the most um, insightful books I read last year was Factfulness by Hans Rossing. So I'd recommend reading that. And then uh, if you want to read more about the, the history of management accounting and uh, uh, the last 100 years, the, the book on that is on uh, uh, the SEMA website. So there's three things to look out for. Marvellous. We'll have links to all of that in the show notes. And I think you did mention that you're working on some more research uh, for later in the years. Anything that you've got coming up that uh, you want to put on our radar? I'm looking at how technology is impacting strategy at the moment. And um, I'm finding that really interesting because as technology takes up a lot of the tactics that are close to agreement and close to certainty, it means that management accountants, accountants in general, need to move to issues that are more complex and complicated. So you need to think about how, how do I work in a world where technology has taken the simple stuff that I used to do and I need now to think more. So that research is going to come out in uh, the autumn. So look out for that. I think I see another interview, which we're going to have to pencil in right now. Uh, Martin Farrar, what is one message you'd like to leave for accounting and finance professionals that will help them to go beyond disruption? Okay, well, I've read a book in the last month called The Polymath, Unlocking the Power of Human Versatility. And in the world of automation, too much specialization in a subject puts you at risk. If, if, if you're so specialized, a, a piece of artificial intelligence can come along and do that for you. So you need to broaden your learning. And I think do something that's at odds with your current expertise. Um, the book mentions drumming. I've never tried drumming, but I think I might try and take it up because it's a, it's a different way of using your brain. And I think some of my best ideas when I'm researching in the accounting world come from when I'm not thinking about accounting. It's about when I'm doing something else. So maybe take up drumming to help me in my communication. I've started reading one poem a day just to think differently. So try something that's out of your comfort zone and new learning. I'll get my drumsticks out uh, and perhaps an anthology of, of lovely poems. Uh, Dr. Martin Farrar, the Associate Technical Director for Management Accounting at the Association for International Certified Professional Accounting, telling us all about his research into the first 100 years of management accounting. Thank you, 
Martin. Uh, that's a great place to end our conversation today. There's plenty more about uh, Martin's research into the history of accounting. And we'll also have a, a link to a video which explains just what a slide rule is. Uh, we'll put all of that in our show notes, including links to all of the resources that Dr. Farrar has mentioned. Uh, you can visit gobeyondisruption.com for more. Just scroll down the page. Uh, you'll see the media player. Click on the latest episode and that will give you all the information you need. Uh, talking of websites, there are two others we'd recommend for anyone interested in taking this topic further. If you're already a member either of the ARCPA or uh, SEMA, you may already be using one or the other of these websites, depending on where you are in the world. So you may already have these in the bookmarks on your browser. ARCPAstore.com slash go beyond disruption or cgmastore.com slash go beyond disruption. That's where you find courses, webinars and more professional development resources consistently updated to keep you ahead of the curve, which is exactly what we've been talking about with my guest, Dr. Martin Farrar. Thanks again to Dr. Farrar and to you for listening. From our UK office, I'm Kyle Hannan. We'll be back soon with more conversations that help you and your profession to go beyond disruption. Till next time, goodbye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. It is provided with the understanding that the association, its affiliates, and subsidiaries are not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. The association, its subsidiaries, and affiliates make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein and expressly disclaim all liability for such damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material.